I want to take you through the double slit variation, except with a little less hand waving on it. Uh, the way that I had done it, and I have a video on it, goes through a long, complex way. And I found, and over the, well, I guess on Friday specifically, uh, I came up with a shorter way of doing it. Longer than what we did last Wednesday, but, or last Monday, but shorter than the video. So first, a little bit of background. Pythagorean theorem. If this is a right triangle with sides A, B, and C, what is the relationship between the sides? Uh, a squared plus B squared equals C squared. All right. That's the other one. And that works fine as long as the, the angle opposite C is a right angle. However, if it's not a right angle, there's still a variation of, of it. And I assume what from the nods that you remember that you've at least seen law of cosines. Hmm. No, I've seen it before. Okay. It was like six years ago. Okay, it has not changed, fortunately. Right. Uh, what did I miss? The background theory. Oh. All right, so it starts out the same way as the other one. We have c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. However, we do need to take account the, into account this angle here, the fact that it's not 90 degrees. So it's minus 2ab cosine of that angle. So if that angle is 90 degrees, we get the cosine of 90 degrees, which is 0. And so this whole term drops out, and we get Pythagorean theorem. So Pythagorean theorem is just a specific case of law of cosines. We will be using law of cosines in just a moment. Why bring it up? What's that symbol? That's a gamma. Okay. Yeah. The lowercase gamma. Lowercase gamma. All right, so we have our two slits here. They are distance D apart. Uh, a, B, C, and capital D are just points. Capital A is where this slit is. B is halfway between A and C. C is where the second slit is, and D is some point on a screen far off, or relatively far off, some distance L away. Now your textbook uses X here instead of L. I'm using L just out of habit and to keep track with my notes, uh, but just recognize that your textbook labels that as X. This distance from the central point to where this maximum is is Y, your textbook and I would use the same letter there. So questions about the setup. Of, well, actually, questions about law of cosines. And are there any questions about the setup? All right, so let's take a look at this triangle BCD. So it's this, the lower part of this triangle here. Using the law of cosines, I know that r2 squared, so this length here squared, is equal to r squared plus 1 half of d squared minus 2 r 1 half of d times the cosine of the angle opposite it. So the cosine, so the angle opposite by r2 here is that whole angle right there which is just whatever theta is plus 90 degrees. So this would be the cosine of theta plus 90 degrees. Questions about how I got that using law of cosines? How'd you get the plus 90? I'm uh, defining theta as being from the oh, horizontal here. I, I see now. Theta okay. or from the original plus that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's make it explicit that it's a right angle there. Other questions at the moment? I can do very something very similar for ABD. So this from ABD. So basically, from the top slit to the middle to this point D over there. 
That would just be R1 squared. Oh, you're stopping there? Uh, plus R1. Oh, plus R equals. Oh, equals R squared. Plus, uh, plus parentheses one half B squared. Minus two R. Uh, parentheses one half B uh, cosine. It's still the same. It's oh, it's not the same. Yeah, that's uh, that's more why I stopped there. So the angle opposite R one is this angle right here. That's the angle. Oh, minus theta. Say it again. Is R be minus theta? And it is minus theta. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> Now, we need to simplify a little bit, use a little trick. This one's the simpler of the two. Cosine of 90 degrees minus theta. In unison, this would be awesome. You're about to impress everyone in here. Three, two, one, go. Sine of theta. Sine of theta? I said round. Yes. I don't. It is sine of theta. Uh, we get, there are several ways of going about this. Um, I'm going to, if I have the sum of two angles here, that would be the cosine of A times the cosine of B minus the sine of A times the sine of B. That, there's some formula in trig where you can get that. So if it's 90, so if A is 90 degrees, we get the cosine of 90 degrees times the cosine of negative theta, because it's plus negative, minus the sine of 90 degrees, sine of negative theta. Well, cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. So that whole term drops out. Sine of 90 degrees? One. So I get negative sine of negative theta, and Sine is an odd function. Uh, that's the official name for functions that do this. That the sine of negative theta is the same as negative sine of theta. In other words, it's just sine of theta. There are other ways, visually similar. But try to try it out if you're not convinced. Type in 30 degrees sine and 60 degrees cosine, and you'll see you get this exact same answer. So this is just sine of theta. Cosine of theta plus 90 degrees. Yeah, trig, calculus, and stuff. That's that's where you think where I start to get lost. All right. Well, hopefully someone else can come to your aid here. So I can't really do like things in unison, like how that uh, in that previous thing was sine of theta. Well, the other approach is the circle, the unit circle. You've had trig, presumably you know what the unit circle is. I got it. It's out of a nod. It sounds familiar. Okay, that's good. If the radius is one, then if I have some angle here, theta, this line right here intersects the circle at the cosine of theta, the sine of theta. That's basically the unit circle. Okay. So when the angle is zero degrees, it intersects at the point one, zero. So the cosine of zero degrees is one, the sine is zero. Up here, this is the point zero, one. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero. The sine of 90 degrees is one. So if I have some theta plus 90 degrees, Well, let's just, let's throw in, let's make theta equal to 30 degrees. So this becomes 120 degrees. So that puts it over here. That's 120 degrees-ish. Uh, 
a little bit off there. What can you tell me about the cosine? It's negative. It's negative. All right. And the sine? Positive. All right. So the cosine of this, if theta is in between 0 and 90 degrees, which it actually would be in this case, the sine's positive, but the cosine's negative. So whatever it is, it's going to be a negative of, and it turns out it's the negative sine of theta. That is the negative sine of theta. If you plugged into here, the only difference is the theta has become positive, and you're left with negative sine of theta. So my equation here is I have r2 squared equals r squared plus d over 2 squared minus 2r, uh, actually that negative and that negative will cancel. So plus 2r one half uh, d over 2 sine of theta. The second equation becomes r1 squared is equal to r squared plus d over 2 squared minus 2r d over 2 sine of theta. Simplify it a little bit by that two and that two cancel out. So r times, so it would then become r times r times d sine theta. Yes, yes it would. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract on the left hand side. I have r two squared minus r one squared. On the right hand side, the r squareds cancel out. The d over 2 squares cancel out. Then I'm left with this rd sine theta, as Holden just said, minus negative rd sine theta, which is 2 rd sine theta. Oh. Yes, get rid of stuff, unnecessary stuff. Any questions on this stuff over here before I raise it? Yeah, all this, I think all this math stuff just, all this math stuff believes me, I just, I guess when you try to break down and explain the equations, I just, uh, just get this blank stare of, uh, of what? And there is a, there are certain times in physics where you just have to go, all right, I'm just assuming that what I'm being told is true. Yeah. And then later on when you realize I made a mistake, then you go back and ask me about it. But that's kind of I say that to me all the time. I'm just I just see this stuff and I I won't question this stuff as I won't question all the equations and stuff. It's just Probably to save my save myself from getting lost and right. stuff, but you do bring up a good point about how you need to need to know it just to avoid making a mistake. Yeah, uh, but the main reason why I'm going through all this is so that I'm not just throwing an equation at you. That you see that it does flow from the stuff that we've already done. All right, so. I have this equation now. I've simplified it down to I've got these two paths, R1 and R2. I know that they are off. If, I, if D is a bright spot, if capital D right here is the location of a bright spot, I know that R1 and R2 have to be a wavelength apart. It's constructive interference. It's, it's if D is a maximum, I wrote the plural here, but if it's a maximum, then they are off by some either one wavelength, two wavelengths, three wavelengths zero wavelength, so integral number of wavelengths. Oh. Is that backward Z? I don't know what oh, there exists. Oh. If there exists a, a bright spot at D, then R2 is just R1 plus some integer times number of wavelengths. 
So I say in lambda, where n is an, L, is an element of integers, in other words, it's an integer, and lambda is the wavelength of the light, which for our laser was about 650 nanometers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula right here and plug it in for R2. That demo that you did only works if you have a light source that's only emitting one wavelength? Uh, it works for other wavelengths, but uh, for different wavelengths, you're going to get um, there's going to be sort of a spread that different wavelengths will have different bright spots at different spots, different points. So if you were shining white light through it, uh, you might not notice it because the colors will there'll be some blurring together and it, it, a little less dramatic. Is that sufficient? Yeah. Okay. So I've got R1 plus n lambda squared plus look, minus R1 squared. So again, just plugged in for R2 is equal to 2RD sine theta. R squared in a binomial. R1 squared plus 2R1 n lambda plus n lambda squared minus R1 squared is equal to Rd sine theta. My R1 squares cancel out. I'm going to divide by 2R. So going from here to here, I'm going to divide by 2R. Or multiply by 1 over 2R. So over here, I've got R1 over R in lambda, plus n squared lambda squared over 2R is equal to 2R d sine theta. At this point, I have made no approximations. All of this is exact. I'm about to make the first approximation. What I, what I did last week was I said, well, this triangle is similar to that triangle, and there was a big hand wave, and this is sort of you know, translated fewer hand waves into this. But this is the first time I am going to actually make an approximation. Remember that lambda here is the wavelength of light. So we're talking on the order of 10 to the negative seventh meters, or a couple hundred nanometers. R is the distance from where the slit is to where the screen is. Well, technically, L is the shortest distance. R is from here to where that maximum point is. So R is bigger than L. And in the case of what we did in class yesterday, it was, what, two meters or something? On that order, at least. Whereas the wavelength of light was in was only order of a couple hundred nanometers. And then I square it. So this right here is tiny. Now I do have a lambda here. This is small, but come on, this is even smaller. So this is approximately zero. So that's the first approximation that I've made so far. I'm going to make one other approximation. So now I'm left with R1 over R times N lambda is equal to, oh, forgot to get rid of my 2R on that side, is equal to D sine theta. I'm now going to show that R1 over R is approximately equal to 1. So questions to here, because I'm going to erase this stuff over here. So now I'm going to look at my triangle. I have R1, I have a triangle right here. 
The right triangle, hypotenuse is R1. So using Pythagorean theorem, I know that R1 squared is equal to L squared, that length there, plus this distance, plus Y minus 1 half D squared. And I know that R squared, that's the distance from the center point here, is just L squared plus Y squared. I want to factor out y, so r1 squared is equal to l squared plus y squared times 1 minus d over 2y squared. And so now the second approximation I make, d over 2y. Let's think about that. D is the distance between the slits. Generally, when you're doing a double slit experiment, they are really close together. They're on, that's on the order of millimeters or smaller, sometimes micrometers. In the case of the hair, even though that was officially a single slit, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Y is the distance from here to here. So this is, so my double slit's on the order of 10 to the negative uh, I guess for the hair, we were somewhere on the order of 10 to the negative fifth meters, and this was on the order of 10 to the, the centimeter, so 10 to the negative second. This is a thousand times bigger than that is. So if this is much less than one, then this whole term here is just close enough to one. then R1 squared is equal to S squared plus Y squared, or approximately, which equals R squared. Therefore, R1 is roughly equal to R, and so this becomes N lambda is equal to D sine theta. That's the double slip formula right there. Looks a little bit different than what I derived last week. I'm gonna now connect it to what we did last week. Questions to hear? If we make the last assumption, and in the next lab that you do, you'll find out at what point that next assumption becomes invalid. If theta is much less than one, in other words, we're talking a small angle there, then sine of theta is approximately equal to the tangent of theta, which is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, which is y over L. And so n lambda is equal to dy over L. That's the formula that I think I derived last week. And this is the formula that the book gives, except they use x instead of L. Now, in the next lab that you do, you're going to make this assumption and you'll end up calculating, I think it's wavelength. And then you won't make that assumption and you'll find wavelength by finding the angle and then the sine of the phase angle. And you'll find that this, so much more accurate than this is once you get past that first, uh, the first or second price slide. All right, so that's a more formal derivation of the double slit formula, double slit experiment. Questions to hear? All right, now I'm gonna do a variation of this using a diffraction breaking. Using a what? Diffraction grating? Yes, grating. Yeah, I was kind of yawn, so I didn't understand. Oh. 
And the grate is just like on you know the sewage where the water pours in down into the sewage system, or water in the gutters goes down into yeah. the drain. It's just uh, it's something with a lot of different slits in it, and water can go through any of the holes. In the case of light, instead of a double slit experiment, you've got multiple. A whole bunch of slits there. Now, what the result ends up being here is that it's here, we'll have the brightest spot in the middle, and then not as bright, and then less bright as you go. Then it gets less bright the farther out you get. But if I have more than one slit, if I got another slit right here, it's going to have its bright spot where this has a less bright spot. And you just get this compounding effect of a whole bunch of bright spots. So the formula still holds true. You have some middle spot, and, and then it, it maintains its brightness longer. So I will show what double slit looks like, and then I'll show a diffraction grading. I'll need a couple of lights. Uh, just one moment. Okay. So that's the one I was using for that. Okay, here we go. Wow. Upside down. That one. This glass plate here is called a Cornell plate, and it's just a whole bunch of predetermined widths, and, and eventually you'll get that list of. Was it made at Cornell? Was it first uh, made at Cornell University? Uh, it might have been. Cornell uh, has. Now I'm thinking University of Rochester. Um, I, I suspect yes. Or it could have just been some guy named Cornell. Let's see, those are What's on this side? Need something in between like this. There we go. Could you kill the lights, please? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a double slit right there. You got the bright spot in the middle, and then it starts to become less bright the farther out you get. Notice that it's different than what we saw with the hair, where we had the bright spot and then it sort of got darker and there was an envelope. And we'll, I guess, talk about that. So uh, the brightest spot seems to be right here. This one next to it. Diffusion grate or, or just double slit? Right? This is just this is just double slit. A uh, diffraction grate. Or oh. grating. Alright, so let's bring the lights up. Alright, so this middle, the brightest spot is n equals zero, and then n equals one, two, three, and so on. They're somewhat relatively evenly spaced, so one, two, three, four, let's just go to the fourth one, this is n is equal to four. It's either plus or minus four, one side is positive, the other side is negative, doesn't really matter which is which. So if this is positive four on the right, this would be negative four on the left. And so I wanna see what my spacing is. I'm assuming that that angle is small enough that I can use this formula. And so, uh, so the distance from n equals four to n equals negative four 
7.9 centimeters. So from n equals negative 4 to n equals 4, 7.9 centimeters, which then translates into, it should be symmetrical. So from 0 to 4, uh, it'll be half that. So 3.9 five centimeters or 0.0395 meters. That is the distance on average from the middle point to this point right here. D is the size of the slits. And then you just oh. and that one Ooh, which one did I shine it to? Do you want me to turn the lights on? No, I, I just need to see where it... For sure it's that one right there. Some there. Yeah, okay, I'm pretty sure it's that one. So looking at my handy dandy guy here, spacing is 0.175 millimeters. is equal to 4, y equals 0 0.0395 meters, and L.